Abby Hafer is a speaker, writer, and humorist who particularly loves taking on intelligent design, creationism, the politics surrounding them, and science not denialism in general. She has recently started debunking the gender binary as well. She's written a book called The Not-So-Intelligent Designer, Why Evolution Explains the Human Body and Intelligent Design Does Not, which was published in 2015. Dr. Hafer has a doctorate in zoology from Oxford University and teaches human anatomy and physiology at Curry College. She's a former DJ and loves doing radio and TV. Please welcome Dr. Abby Hafer. In the beginning, it was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. I don't know if you heard that old bad excuse for homophobia when you were growing up, but I did. There's just one problem with that, and it's this. It's wrong in every possible way. It's stupid. There is actually absolutely nothing correct about that statement. So let's just start again, and I'll do it right this time. In the beginning, there was one sex, and it was female. An individual reproduced by growing a copy of herself and releasing that copy into the environment. This was certainly the case with the first self-copying molecule. Since life began with the first self-copying molecule, this means that females are the first original sex. Let that sink in for a while. In the beginning, it wasn't Adam and Eve. It was Eve. In the beginning, it wasn't this. It was this. So this is a picture of bacteria replicating, that is, copying themselves. And bacteria came along well after that first self-copying molecule. But individual molecules don't photograph very well, so I'm showing you bacteria because bacteria are still pretty ancient. So Eve, that first self-copying organism, made copies of herself. And those copies made more copies and more copies and more copies. Sometimes those copies had mutations. So in biblical terms, Eve begat Eve and Eve and Eve and Eve. And one of those Eves had a slight mutation, that is a slight genetic change, and begat a line of Evelyn's. Some of these mutated further and begat lines of Edith's and Edna's. Meanwhile, the Eves were still busy begetting more Eves, but some of those mutated and became Esme's and Esmeralda's. So the first family didn't look like this, but more like this. So females were really doing pretty well before males came along. Thank you very much. The problems began when Eve's daughters, Edith and Esmeralda, started competing with each other. And thus was the evolutionary arms race begun. The problem was made worse by the fact that Edith continued to mutate and got new advantages over Esmeralda. Meanwhile, poor Esmeralda didn't always mutate fast enough to keep up. Many lines of Esmeraldas were wiped out because of this, and that was the end of their evolutionary line. But then, a mutation took place that allowed some Esmeraldas to swap genes with other members of the population, members who were not Esmeraldas. And this gene swapping saved the day. That's because some of these newly acquired genes allowed the new Esmeraldas to compete successfully with that pesky Edith. The new Esmeralda was no longer a pure Esmeralda, it was true, but by golly, she was alive. So the new improved Esmeraldas got ahead in the evolutionary arms race. And it was good. And that, folks, is how sex was born. And it was good. According to evolutionary biologist W.D. Hamilton, one major benefit that sexual reproduction gives us is the ability to stay ahead of parasites. Parasites work by adapting very precisely to a very specific host species. 
the only potential hosts that are likely to survive are those that have the ability to mix their genetics quickly through sexual reproduction and spread beneficial mutations through the population quickly, also by sexual reproduction. Other biologists have also suggested that the gene exchange done by sexual reproduction also means that siblings are not exact copies of one another and are therefore less likely to compete directly with one another for survival. But one way or another, that's what males are for. Males are genetic mixers. They speed up evolutionary change. Since a male's genes can only survive by contributing to somebody else's reproduction, males have evolved a wide variety of mechanisms for trying to persuade a female to mate with them. There's showing off. Everybody knows about peacocks using their tails to show off and try to attract mates. But did you know about Technicolor vomit? Crustaceans called ostracods vomit luminous mucus in order to attract mates. Isn't that sexy? There's also showering females with gifts. Humans do this. Did you know that bowerbirds do too? Here is a male bowerbird making a really showy nest in order to attract a female. Here's the finished product. There's also trapping females. Trapping isn't pretty, but evolution isn't pretty. There's growing longer penises than the competition. This is what barnacles do. Barnacles are stationary as adults, so getting sperm to the nearest female is a challenge for male barnacles. They also have to compete with one another over this. They are up to the challenge. Barnacles can grow penises up to eight times the length of their own bodies. Barnacles have the longest penises in the world, compared to their body length anyway. Remember this the next time that somebody brags about the size of theirs. So, I've explained to you why sexual reproduction is useful. Let's move on to the whole question of what is natural. The cartoon here, of course, depicts unnatural acts with a sheep. This brings up a really important point. People will spend a whole lot of time telling you what kind of sex is natural and what kind of sex is unnatural, according to them. But you have just learned that sexual reproduction exists as a means of genetic mixing. That's all it is. This genetic mixing does not require a specific set of gender or sexual characteristics. So I'm going to state a bunch of mistaken assumptions that people have about sex and gender, and then take a look at males and females throughout the animal kingdom. You will see how brilliantly creative evolution by natural selection can be, and how diverse the results are in the animal kingdom. There's no one set of rules. Sexuality is a free-for-all. You will also begin to notice how many of these mistaken assumptions are based on some human's wishful thinking, usually about what they would like to see in their own human society. Mistaken assumption number one. Evolution means that males will have no parental involvement and will leave care of infants and children to females, right? Wrong. Here's just one example, emus. Those big flightless birds from Australia. Once the eggs are laid, the male emu is the one who takes care of the eggs and incubates them. Once the eggs hatch, the male raises the chicks. Mistaken assumption number two. Evolution means that males will always be bigger than females and will dominate them, right? Wrong. This is a picture of an anglerfish, which is actually a picture of three anglerfish. Male anglerfish are tiny compared to females. To continue their existence past a certain age, a male anglerfish must attach himself to a female and fuse his body with hers. This female anglerfish has two attached males. 
In the biological sciences, having different sexes of different sizes is called sexual dimorphism. You can tell that the people who invented this term were men, since the... Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, I'll start again with the part about sexual dimorphism. So, in the biological sciences, having two, having different sexes of different sizes is called sexual dimorphism. You can tell that the people who invented this term were men, since the term sexual dimorphism is defined as males being bigger than females. When the females of a species are larger than the males, this is called reverse sexual dimorphism. In other words, human male biologists just assumed that males being bigger than females was the natural state of being. Mistaken assumption number three. But males are at least always the ones with the Y chromosomes, right? Wrong. Birds. All birds. All male birds have two X chromosomes. It's the females who have the Y chromosomes. This is true for some male insects, like moths and butterflies as well, and some crustaceans and some reptiles, including the huge lizards called Komodo dragons. It's called the ZW system instead of the XY system, but that's just to make it easier for people to talk about it. Mistaken assumption number four. Males and females have separate bodies, right? Wrong. Many animals are hermaphrodites. That is, they have both male and female reproductive organs. Most snails are hermaphrodites. So are many jellyfish and many worms. Mistaken assumption number five. But male input is always required for reproduction, right? No. Bonnet head sharks, black tip sharks, leopard sharks, zebra sharks, small white spotted bamboo sharks, many snakes, including boa constrictors, and 50 species of lizards, and a brand new all-female species of crayfish and lizards, as I said, including the Komodo dragons, can all reproduce without males. Mistaken assumption number six. But we always see pictures from the Bible of animals being saved from Noah's flood by going onto a boat two by two. One female and one male. That's what's natural, right? Two by two, one female and one male, right? Wrong. First, many species have some male homosexual individuals. For instance, rams. Yes, rams, that very symbol of raging male horniness. <laughs> rams are male sheep. About 8% of all rams form exclusively male-to-male -male pair bonds, forsaking all contact with female sheep. Some animals routinely practice lesbianism. For instance, this species of albatross has many same-sex female pairs who nest and raise chicks together. Some animals form trios, and some trios are for child rearing. For instance, these skuas. Skuas often nest as mixed-sex trios and raise chicks together. And some trios are for sex. This is a North Atlantic right whale. And this is a photograph of a female North Atlantic right whale having simultaneous sex with two males at once. And when I say simultaneous, I mean simultaneous. That, by the way, is an example of a multi-male breeding system where each female may have many male partners. For something more biblical, there are also multi-female breeding systems. That is where one male may have many female partners. For instance, northern fur seals. This is a male northern fur seal with its many females, just like the Old Testament. But what about primates, our near relatives in the animal kingdom? Well, it turns out that our fellow primates have all different kinds of breeding systems. Here's a graph for you. 
This graph shows that some species of our fellow primates have multi-male breeding systems. Those are the solid dots on this graph. Some have multi-female breeding systems. Those are the open triangles. Some have monogamous breeding systems. Those are the open circles. As for humans, we are the little plus sign in, on the upper right. This graph, by the way, is a plot of testicle weight versus body weight in primates. Somebody checked to see if there was a correlation between that ratio and mating systems, but the results were not clear. You should know that homosexuality, lesbianism, and bisexuality are all found within non-human primates as well. Mistaken assumption number seven. <coughs> But at least males are males and females are females, right? None of this cross-dressing or transgender stuff, right? Wrong. Transgender fish are common. First, barramundi. These fish transition from male to female. Most individuals mature as males. They become female after one or more spawning seasons. Most of the larger specimens are therefore female. Second, blue gropers. These change from female to male. This is a blue groper female. That's correct, it's not blue. It's the males that are blue. Blue gropers are a type of wrasse. Wrasses are famous for changing their sex, usually female to male. All blue gropers begin life as females. This is a blue groper male. Here is how you get a blue groper male. Usually, you will find only one or two male blue gropers in an area and a larger number of female gropers in the same area. Then, when the dominant male dies, the largest female grows, changes color and sex, and becomes the dominant male. Third, clownfish. These change from whatever to male or female. Yes, Nemo himself was gender fluid. <laughs> clownfish start life with no functioning gonads. They are neither sex. There is one breeding pair with a large female, a smaller male, and a bunch of non-sexual or sometimes male smaller individuals. If the female dies, then the male becomes female. If the male dies, then the largest non-breeding fish becomes male. Fourth, dwarf hawkfish. These are even more gender fluid. Hawkfish live in harems, with one dominant male mating with several females. When it comes to sex change, the size of the harem matters. Listen carefully now, because the plot for this is worse than a soap opera. If a male hawkfish takes on too many females, then one of the largest females will change sex, become male, and take over half the harem. But if that new male hawkfish loses a few females to other harems and is challenged by a larger male, then it goes back to being female. That way it doesn't lose precious energy fighting a losing battle. So the ability to change sex in both directions maximizes an individual's ability to reproduce. So, gender fluidity is the name of the game for many species. Mistaken assumption number eight. Okay, okay, so it is clear that nature does not define sex roles, and it is clear that gender fluidity is real, but at least there are two sexes, right? I mean, at most two, maybe one and a half or one, but two at most, right? Wrong again. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Tetrahymena thermophila, the organism with the most creative sex life that I know about. It has seven sexes. You heard me, seven. No wonder it's one of my favorite organisms. 
This single-celled creature, which has been thoroughly studied by biologist Eduardo Arias, mostly reproduces without sex, dividing into two identical daughter cells. That's Eve begetting Eve again. But when food is scarce, the creature can opt for sexual reproduction, which, as I told you before, creates novel genetic combinations that may give daughter cells a better chance of surviving in a harsh environment. Such tough conditions also rewarded the creatures when they developed more sexes because it gave them more mating opportunities. After all, if you only have two sexes, there's only a 50% chance that someone you meet will be of the right type. But with seven different sexes, a creature's chance of meeting Miss Wright or Mr. Wright increases to about 85%. 85% is bigger than 50%, so seven sexes wins. So Tetrahymenothermophila is the swingingest creature I know of. So I think I've done a pretty good job of destroying what is called the argument from nature. There is no such thing as an unnatural gender role. Any time a religion, or anybody else, says that non-heterosexual sex is wrong because it is unnatural, it is clear that they are making things up. It is clear that we should not make assumptions about naturalness, or unnaturalness, or any given gender role, or gender fluidity. We cannot use the excuse of what is natural as an excuse for the bad treatment of women, or men, or anybody in the LGBT community. So, having eliminated, eliminated the natural, let's move on to the supernatural. Let's talk about morality. The philosopher John Loftus has proposed what he calls the outsider test of faith. In this test, he says that people of all faiths should be as skeptical about the supernatural claims of their own faith as they are about the supernatural claims of other faiths. That is, if you are inside a faith, you should be as skeptical as you would be if you were outside it. For instance, let's suppose that you are skeptical about the ancient Greeks' claim that every day the god Helios harnesses his four-horse chariot and so moves the sun across the sky. You think that the evidence for this is not very strong, even though many people who claimed to know these things thought it was true and wrote about it at the time. According to the outsider test of faith, if you are skeptical about Helios, then you should be equally skeptical about the claim that the Judeo-Christian God created Adam and Eve as the first humans. If there is no objective evidence for Adam and Eve that is better than the evidence for Helios and his four-horse chariot, then you need to doubt the supernatural claims of your faith. That's the outsider test of faith. I wish to propose a new test, a test for morality. Think of it as being like an outsider test of morality. It is similar to the outsider test of faith. In this test, you must justify your moral code, but not use any claim of the supernatural in order to do so. Why? Because the evidence for your supernatural being is no better than the evidence for anybody else's supernatural being. If you won't believe in Helios, then nobody else is under any obligation to believe in your god or goddesses. So all claims of morality based on the sayings or commands of gods or goddesses and claims of morality based on holy books all fail this test. If you can justify your morality without referring to the supernatural, then you have at least started on the road toward a good moral code. This outsider test of morality may also be called the non-supernatural test of morality. I think it's a good test. It's a tough test, but not an impossible one. And keep in mind that it is only the beginning of developing a good moral code. It's a necessary first step. Let's see how this works out based on examples from real life. First, from my home state of Massachusetts, the Salem Witch Trials. 
In these infamous cases, innocent people were put to death by the Puritans after having been convicted of witchcraft. These clearly fail the non-supernatural test of morality. Without reference to the supernatural, there is no case against the women and men who were hanged. So these convictions for witchcraft make no sense because they clearly fail the outsider test of morality. This is also interesting because there are two institutions that descend from the Puritan church. They are the Congregational Church and the Unitarian Universalist Church. Neither of these institutions would dream of doing something so irrational or hateful today. This goes to show that it is a good idea for religions to revise their thinking from time to time. Sometimes religions like to claim that they deal in timeless truths, but actually all religions do revise their tenets from time to time. It's just that some religions are more honest about this than others. I have some personal interest in this case. Some of my ancestors were Puritans and were living in Salem at the time. Some of them were among the people who allowed this madness to happen. I am very glad that the faith and morality of my ancestors has been revised and improved. I do not consider our modern society to be less moral than that earlier one. I consider it to be more moral. Next. Jewish dietary laws. These pass the non-supernatural test of morality. Why? Because no harm is done. And if people wish to express their cultural affiliation in this way, then that is their choice. Following these laws because they are written in a holy book doesn't make someone a better person for following them, but it doesn't make them a worse one either. Next. Helping the poor because your religion tells you to. This passes the non-supernatural test of morality. The action is good, and the motivation is, in this case, irrelevant. So now we get to recent history. On June 12, 2016, an armed, an armed man killed 49 people and wounded another 53 people in a terrorist attack on a gay nightclub in Orlando, Florida called Pulse. The murderer claimed that he was inspired by the Islamic State. Is the Islamic State anti-gay? Why, yes it is. What's more, during the months that led up to the shooting, the United States had been treated to a whole series of so-called bathroom bills. These bills require transsexual people to use the public bathrooms that match their original birth gender, regardless of their current gender identity. However, that's only the tip of the iceberg. For instance, in North Carolina's infamous bathroom bill, we heard about trans people and bathrooms, but that bill also allowed employment discrimination based on sexual orientation. It allowed discrimination against LGBT customers. It allowed discrimination against LGBT people in accommodations. And and it said that no city or locality could enact laws preventing these types of discrimination. Although some Christians opposed these bathroom bills, many others supported this type of discrimination against LGBT people, and they did so in the name of their God. Here's a quote from one. I believe that God got it right in Genesis 5 and 2 when he made them male and female. If God didn't give you access to a male or female bathroom via your anatomy, neither should we give you access via ordinance or legislation, period. And that was spoken in the chamber of the North Carolina legislature in 2016. This guy is claiming to speak for God. He is also using a so-called holy book to justify his bigotry. 
This is just one example. And this was the political atmosphere in the United States just prior to the Pulse nightclub shooting. So we have Christians who claim to speak for a supernatural entity when they say that LGBT folks are bad. We have Islamists shooting people because of a so-called holy book that claims to speak for a supernatural entity. Here's a clue. Nobody can honestly speak for a supernatural entity. That includes the people who wrote the so-called holy books. If shooting someone is bad, then shooting someone is bad, period. If you try to excuse it by referring to a so-called holy book, it is still bad. A so-called holy book is no excuse for bad behavior. Any so-called word of God cannot be used morally to justify bad actions. But here is my most important point. Most people already accept the non-supernatural test of morality. Even most people who believe in the supernatural already accept the non-supernatural test of morality. How do I know this? Consider the Bible. In it, there are numerous references to slavery, to selling your children, to rape, and to genocide. The Bible does not condemn any of these heinous practices. The Ten Commandments are silent on all these subjects with the exception of killing. However, even with killing, God tells the Israelites to kill all the Canaanites, every man, woman, and child. That is, God tells them to commit genocide, and they do. Then the Bible acts like that's okay because a supernatural being said that it was okay. Now you know why I don't trust the word of supernatural beings, and I especially don't trust the word of people who claim to speak for them. Most other people don't trust them either. Allow me to demonstrate this to you. If I ask a fundamentalist of any stripe if they would kill me if God told them to, the honest ones will say yes, they would kill me if God told them to. On the other hand, if God tells me to kill them, I won't do it. So my question to you is this. Who would you rather sit next to on a public bus? <laughs> you can see from this that we have already entered the world of the non-supernatural test of morality. We like the non-supernatural test of morality. The non-supernatural test of morality is what most people already use, whether they admit it or not. In addition, most people today would say that slavery, selling your children, rape, and genocide are all immoral, even though the Bible says that these things are all okay. Again, we have already entered the world of the non-supernatural test of morality, and it's a better world. In this better world, no one has any divine rights. Men don't have God-given dominion over women. Humans don't have God-given dominion over anything. We are responsible for figuring things out. Sex is a matter of informed consent. Marriage is acknowledged as a human invention. We recognize that sometimes bad luck is just bad luck. There is no divine justice. There is no karma. This life is the only one that matters. We must love and comfort each other. And finally, this planet and all its life is ours to protect. This is important. We can understand the consequences of our actions, and we must act that way. No God will save us. No God will save the planet. The earth and the living things on it are holy. That is, they are worthy of supreme respect. 
not because they are supernatural, but because they are life. And that is amazing and precious enough. Thank you. Sure. Anyone have questions? A uh, comment on the news a few months ago was a story that the slaughter of the Canaanites is not likely to have ever taken place. So perhaps even the people alive back when these things were written, uh, didn't actually follow their own scriptures. Well, yeah, I mean, the idea that a lot of things in the Bible are fiction is not news to this audience. But on the other hand, the idea that that story is a basis for what is considered a book of morality that people use today, that's really the part that I'm getting at, you know, in talking about this. Whether it actually happened or not is of less importance to me anyway than how morality is shaped around these stories. Wow. <laughs> Nothing about cool fish. I mean. Yeah, that was great. Um, so my question is, uh, just in conversations I've had with others, um, especially about like gender fluidity, how, how do the examples of other species necessarily apply to humans? Because that's usually kind of the, the, the critique I get is that like, well, like those are fish, right? Like, um, and then they argue that they're just like gender binaries in humans, and it's just a separate issue. So how does that? How do oh yeah, well, I, well, there's sort of two answers to that, and they're both important. The first one is that there is this general purpose. Uh, I believe it is especially a Catholic body of work called the argument from nature. And they say, look at nature. You know, their animals are either male or they are female. And the point is the people who worked on this stuff were either ignorant or lying or both. Um, but this is actually considered an important body of work. It is something that people point to when they are talking about why, you know, gay people are bad or this kind of thing. So I felt it was important just to debunk that whole end of the argument. And yeah, I have heard people say before, but we're talking about people, not animals. Now, the first thing is that if you are going to talk about what is unnatural, I have just shown you nature in all of its glory. So as I said, you cannot say that you know lesbianism is unnatural when you see it throughout nature. But even if you then, if they want to like say, okay, we're only gonna talk about people here, well, there are human lesbians too. And there are human gay men, and there are people who have trios and just about anything you can think of, humans do. Um, and if you want to talk about people living in a state of nature, which I'm not sure exists, um, but let's say humans that have not had much contact with Western societies, you'll still find all kinds of different arrangements and gender identities and you name it. It is not the clear binary that people will talk about in the West. So um, that's kind of the, the one to punch against the argument from nature, but that's why I also then finish the story by talking about the supernatural, because it's like once you have backed people into a corner away from it's unnatural, then they want to go to, but God says it's bad. So that's why I then want to get into basing your moral code on something other than the supernatural and that that is actually better rather than worse. This is something else I'm trying to do deliberately here is I'm sure people here have run into it, the whole problem that people will say, but how can you be moral when you're not afraid of God, you know, when you're not afraid of going to hell and being punished and this kind of thing? And the point that I'm trying to make is to actually flip that argument, not just to sort of pathetically say, oh, we're just as good as you are, even without a God to punish us. I'm saying, no, it's not that we're just as good as they are. We're better. 
because we, I am saying, have to base our actions on something other than the excuses they're kind of given in holy books. So, and, and you'll notice I was very caref careful about saying this is just the beginning of starting on a good moral code. It's not the whole, sto the whole story, but on the other hand, just dispense with your holy books first, and now let's talk about what would be a good moral code. But uh, seriously, I strongly recommend that when you run into that argument from religious people, go that route. Flip it. Tell them your morality is better than theirs, and here's why. That'll start an interesting conversation or take it in a different direction. All right, that's all the time we have for questions. If we could give Abby one more round of applause, please.